Hey there, y'all. It's Click Dork again. And uh, once again, I, I'm looking at an industry trend. We're talking about data literacy today. I've stayed at a Holiday Inn Express recently. I feel very, very comfortable talking about this topic um, as an expert. But just in case you don't trust my expertise, I also have two friends on the line. I've got Zach Geminani and Jordan Morrow. Zach is the founder and CEO of Juice Analytics and is um, based in Nashville, Tennessee. I met Zach at a conference um, several years ago. Um, he was presenting. He had a book, which we'll talk more about later. And I went running up. I think I knocked over two or three old ladies on the way to the stage and asked Zach what I needed to do to get a copy of his book. And he says, oh, just get on Amazon. It's like, no, no, no. What do I need to get that book, like, right now? Um, because I, it was amazing to see a book on the subject of data fluency and, and being a couple years ago it wasn't just a hot trend this was just something Zach was really passionate about I've got Zach's information there um, Jordan joined um, click was it about a year ago Jordan yeah it was about it was June of 2016 so we're going on about 20 months now I think okay fantastic so more than a year ago and when when Jordan came on, and I got kind of like an email introduction that he's going to be, you know, on the on the um, Click team. I saw this title of Global Data Literacy Evangelist. It's like that just rocks. Um, so I reached out to Jordan immediately, and uh, we we've done an awful lot of collaboration lately. And uh, Jordan will share more about what he's done. Um, I've got Jordan's information there. As we end this thing, I'll, I'll flip back to these screens. But um, if you want to take a screenshot of this stuff um, so that you can reach out to these guys, um, absolutely feel free to do that. Um, I'm going to flip things over to you, Zach, um, so you can see her. So I'm going to make you presenter. Excellent. Thanks, Dalton. Uh, the, really happy to be here with you guys. Um, the good news is those those old ladies are okay, um, and you got your book, so it, that worked out well. Um, I'm going to show. Not my... often I get a free book, so that that's free even book. better. I know people love that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share some slides that are kind of uh, a background, a little background on Juice and the problem that we solve, and talk about our perspective on this concept of data fluency or literacy. Um, but I hope you guys will interrupt me so it's not uh, just me going on and on um, and just give you some background on on kind of our perspective. Uh, you know, the, the thing about, so I, I started this company uh, over a dozen years ago uh, with my brother. Uh, we've had a really fun run of it. And from very early on, we sort of saw this problem of this uh, the communication of data we felt like was broken and I don't think it's solved just yet so sometimes I like to explain this as just the way the way you know it's broken is the way data gets delivered today from authors of, of data to the audiences it gets delivered as attachments to your emails which nobody wants to open I bet you guys have had that experience so you've done the hard work of gathering data and analyzing it. No one wants to look at it. It it happens. The other thing we see when people are trying to communicate data is that you end up in some conference room with someone at the front droning on, going through a 50-page slide deck, one one chart after the next. No one no one really wants to pay attention to that. You know, even even advanced dashboards and with tech, the technologies that have come along, you know, still it's not clear to me and in all the conversations I have all the time that, that people understand what, they, what they're supposed to draw out of these dashboards, what it's supposed to mean for them. And even, you know, even when the people have self-service analytical tools that allow you to slice and dice data in dozens of, of ways, I think people still struggle with well, how do I how do I do that? What are, what are the skills I need? And so this is kind of the world that that Juice comes into, and I care about is like how do we solve this problem of helping people um, take data they have, communicate it to people who are going to take some action on that data. And I'll just 
give you a quick background on Juice as a company. Um, we, uh, my brother and I started this company a, a little while ago. Uh, you know, we want, we thought about this. Um, we started with a lot more hair than we have now. Um, and we, you know, we were trying to bridge this last mile of data is the way we, we thought about it. Starting Juice as a consulting firm. We actually, for a long time, we, um, we worked with companies building and designing dashboards and analytical tools and, and fashion ourselves as data visualization experts over that time and had this opportunity to, to um, in around 2012, to get to work on writing a book that sort of summarized a lot of our thinking about how do you communicate data more effectively in an organization. And then over the last few years, what we've tried to do is take all that thinking how do you visualize data? How do you tell stories with data? How do you get people to do something when they are confronted with data and take smart actions and build that into a technology solution? Um, and what we've done over the last few years is, is build up a technology solution that allows you to create uh, really great interactive uh, data applications that are really focused on this problem of of getting people to engage with and and understand data, particularly for people who are non-analysts. That's one of the things we often talk about is like the the analyst market for data visualization and data exploration tools is fairly well served. It's all the other people. It's the people who don't like to work with data, who aren't interested in opening that spreadsheet, um, who are not well served, and that's the audience that we're trying to reach. Um, with our technology platform. Fantastic. Come come back to that slide one 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 sure second. Um, let's let's get to that in there because I don't want anybody to miss that that ending bracket there. Powering data products. This was the presentation I saw of yours years ago, um, and you talked about data as a product, which was kind of intriguing. That's why I end up picking your session. Um, and, I, and I don't want people to miss um, when Zach's talk about presenting data here. What he what what they do is try to help companies not only just present this where it's like the C-suite looking at a scorecard. Um, Y'all actually help organizations take data that they have that they would do normal analytics on, and also wrap that in a way that they can actually present and sell that data. As a product, which I thought, which I found very intriguing. Um, so, so yeah, I think it would be easy. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be easy if people were just watching this to think data product meaning oh, it's just a scorecard, it's a dashboard, it's a mashup. It's way more than that. Um, it's a, it's actually you guys help organizations make money on their data by presenting it so easy that even end users can get to it. So. Feel free to move on. I didn't. I didn't want to miss yeah, that. Yeah, no, that, that's right. And that you know maybe it's a it's it's a topic for a whole another discussion around uh, this concept of data monetization. It's something that we're we're really engaged with. Is companies looking outside of their organization and thinking about how do they take the data that they have that's an asset, package that into a product, and deliver that as a valuable solution to their customers. I think it's a it's sort of an emerging area where where people are still learning what what that means and what the opportunities are, um, but we have a lot of clients who who really under, are understanding the value there. So thanks thanks for touching on that. So we um, we built it, we wrote, we wrote this book, um, taking a lot of the lessons we learned. One of the the really important we had this opportunity as we um, started work publisher Wiley on this um, it was sort of open-ended to say what do you want to write about and um, you know we had certainly done a lot of things with data visualization but the, the, the area that we felt like had not been well um, really tackled out there and, the, and really the topic of, of this discussion is, is not just how do you visualize data there's a lot of books about that stuff it's how do you how do you help a whole organization become better at that communication um, of data and visualization is like is one tool in your toolkit to do that more effectively but it's it's far from the full picture of, of what you need in order to become a more data fluent organization so we wanted to take that kind of broader perspective on it um, we call it data fluency you guys call it data literacy I, I'll be curious if there's any difference I don't, I'm not sure that 
um, that I would say that there's, I think we're both pointed at the same solution, um, or the same problem. You know, to us, it's about using data as a language in order for people to more effectively talk together about their problems and share information and make smarter decisions uh, within an organization. Um, so it's all like this new language of data is, is emerging, but a lot of people struggle um, to learn it and use it and make it a valuable piece of how they um, how their organization works. And to us, when we think about data fluency, it's much less about the things on the left in this picture, which I think is really where the industry has focused so much energy. You know, I want to buy a better tool that's going to help me use my data better or or big data, more data, um, data lakes. Like there's all there's all these kind of ways that we can worry about the technology and tools, but to us the answer is much more in the things on the right, thinking about how do you have better leadership around how you use data and guiding people to use it in the way that they communicate and how, making sure that people in organizations have the right skills and ways of interacting together that bring data into the conversation. So in our book, we focus much more on the things on the right and the stuff on the left, like there's always gonna be cool new tools and capabilities and technologies moving forward, but that is not not the problem. The problem is the, the things on the on the right. We came up with, um, I come from a consulting background, so it's, everything gets put into four box uh, quadrants. And this is a this is the framework that we came up with as a way for people to think about how to build a data fluent organization. And we wanted to think about it on the uh, on the left hand side here, both from a individual kind of person, the skills that a person should have, uh, can have to be more data fluent themselves. And then stepping back from that, looking at the whole organization and saying, what skills does the organization need to have? What processes should be in place so the organization can be um, more data fluent? So those are kind of two levels. And then, and then the other distinction that we make, and there's often a blurring between these two sides, but it, we found it useful to think about the people who are recipients of that data, of those data products, of the reports and the dashboards and, and all the ways the data gets consumed, what skills do those people need? What things do we ha need to have in place to make those consumers of data more effective? And then on the other side, the, the producers of those, I'll, I'll talk about data products, but you know, again, it's, it's dashboards or reports or however the data is being communicated Sometimes we'll call them the authors. You know, those are the people who are using data to try to get a message across. And what are the skills that they need at an individual level and what organizational um, capabilities do we need so that those are successful? And that, that sort of fi filled out for us the full picture of the pieces that, that are necessary. We need a data literate consumers. Um, we need authors of data products who are good at what they do. We need a culture um, in an organization that encourages data fluency. And then we need kind of the, the capabilities in place so that people can create effective data products and share those throughout the organization. So I wanna um, walk through each of those, really just touch on them quickly to help um, people understand what we mean. Data literate consumers is about having people who understand where the data comes from. They know how to look at a look at a data visualization or look at data and find insights in that data, especially know how to read data. Um, they need to be critical consumers of that information. So they, they need to understand that the person who's delivering that information has a, has a bias and has messages they're trying to get across. So you need to be a critical consumer and they need to understand the language of data. That's kind of the skill set that we lay out in the book for those consumers. Data authors or data producers. This is really an area where, where we've written a ton about on our blog. I definitely encourage people to take a look at that. You know, this is where you say, how do you, how do you get good at choosing the right visualization, 
narrowing down your message of what you want to convey, um, weaving together your message into a story that is going to be engaging for people, make it make the thing look good. You know, there's a lot of value in, in making sure that things kind of you're conveying things in in attractive, easy to understand ways, and ultimately be focused on what can your audience do with the data that you're delivering. That's how we think about all, some of the kind of building blocks for the authors of data products. Data Building a data fluent culture is to us something that needs to start with leadership. It needs to be start with um, executives at organizations, uh, both through their actions and through their words, saying, um, we're going to use data as an important part of how we drive decision making in our organization. And, and we've seen organizations that are really good at that and others that are not. Um, we also know that one of the real things that can um, inhibit effective use of data is when people don't have a common language and don't know when they're talking about a particular metric that that metric means the same thing to everyone in the organization so trying to get kind of standardized as to what what the data means um, what and what its relevance is um, and getting people focused on what are the key metrics um, that are going to be success that's going to make the organization successful those are kind of the building blocks of a data fluent culture and then the last thing this is sort of gets a little bit more technical but in order to have an organization, we've, we've worked with a lot of clients where there is just dozens and sometimes hundreds of reports that are getting sent around all over the place. And there are dozens of dashboards that people are supposed to look at. And there's kind of this proliferation of different views of the data that happen all over the place. And an effective data fluent organization has ways of managing that kind of chaos that can happen as information is sent all over the place and everyone's shooting, creating stuff but not uh, curating the content and um, we have a little we have the chapter that we have about the data ecosystem is really trying to give people the the tool set of saying what do you need in place in order to make sure that people that we have really high quality communication tools that get everyone that it doesn't overwhelm the system and people know what they should be focused on. Um, and that's really, you know, I think I have, I have a few more slides kind of about juice and, and our technology platform. But I think for this conversation, I just want to I'll probably just leave it there to say, um, you know, that's that's what we're really passionate about. That's what I've, I've spent over a decade focused on and and it is an area that I'm excited to have this conversation with you guys because it's an area that I feel like persists and, and there aren't a lot of good solutions. And I think the industry needs to find better ways of helping people be more literate with their data um, because there's so much unlocked value if everyone kind of could use the data more effectively in their organization. I, I could not agree more with that last statement. And uh, Zach, that's why I've, I've uh, I stayed in touch with you. I, I really value what you're doing for the industry. Um, and uh, I'll share a little bit more. You, you use the phrase, the chaos created <laughs> by seeing so much data. I'm going to share something on that. Jordan, I'm going to go ahead and change you to presenter for now. And so you could take the ball there, my friend. Okay. You bet. Let me share my, my screen here. All right. Every, can you see that okay? I can. And it looks That's awesome. good, too. Those are good-looking well, visuals. I can't wait to see well, those. <laughs> I knew that uh, with you being the one hosting the podcast and, and seeing what you've done before, I had to make it look good in some way. And I actually love what Zach presented. To your point, Zach, <clears throat> I'm actually going to probably, hopefully not sound too much like a broken record, because you're exactly right. The, the terminology is one thing. You might call it data fluency. We're calling it data literacy, but they're married together in such a great, perfect way, trying to just essentially help individuals. I like to dream big, individuals all over the world, right, to, to be able to compete and understand the analytics economy and succeed there. And so in the end here, one of the things that you'll find, your, your last statement there, and I agree with uh, Dalton on this, is 
how do we make that happen? Well, my job here at Click, not only am I the, uh, a glo the global data literacy evangelist, I'm also the global head of data literacy as a whole here at Click. And uh, I go around speaking like you do. I, I blog a lot. I, I tweet and do all this stuff. But I've also been building a program around it um, with a lot of free content and things to help people do that. But let me go through my presentation. And at any point, Dalton, you or um, Zach here have a question, let me know. But let's, let's jump into it here. So the, the way I kind of want to start what I'm going to present, and, and I'll try to avoid repeating too much, is kind of talk about what has led us to the point that we're at where um, we have so much data being produced, um, but not enough people to consume it properly, right? And when you think of data literacy and data fluency, I love how you were saying it, Zach, is this is not necessarily designed for the data scientist, for those that are out there that already know how to do this. The ones that we need to tackle are those that don't have a skill set in these, in these uh, topics and in these subjects. And so if you think about it, most people, when they go to university or school, they're not like us. They're not going because they want to study statistics. They're not going because they want to study computer engineering. Some people are, but a lot of people go for other degrees and for other things. And so when they hit the workforce and you combine that with the revolution we're going through right now with data, it means we have a massive skills gap. And so I want to talk about that here. And I'm I'm a big lover of mountains, so you're going to get a mountain backdrop to start off on this slide. I'm always in the mountains running and playing. But to start off, I like, I like showing this infographic right here. This is 2017. What happens in an Internet minute? And I like to show this slide in my presentations because it shows people just how much data is actually being produced. Because historically, I think people thought of data as just being numbers, right? They might have thought it in a relational database sort of framework. But reality is, in our day and age, customer sentiment, tweets, all of these things count as data. And as you look at this, and it's kind of funny when I share this with people, you can sit here and see that in 60 seconds, an Internet Minute last year, 452,000 tweets were sent. 40,200 posts were uploaded to Instagram. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to see that many pictures of what people are eating. You know what I mean? But to each his own, they can do that. Uh, how many hours and minutes are watched from Netflix, YouTube, Facebook? How many uh, logins are there? So you combine all this data, and recently here at Click, we actually uh, just did a survey uh, across the U.S. We just released the results this week on, on Monday. We find that 33% of employees in the, U in the U.S. feel data literate. So that means two-thirds of employees do not feel like they have data literacy. And when you get to the lower levels, when we're talking about maybe end users, the non-analyst positions, that drops down to 21%, so an even more alarming number. But when you combine that, it says that three-quarters of the people thought that their company would value them more if they were data literate. So we see this gap, right? I don't feel data literate, but I feel like I would be valued more at my organization. This goes right in data literate, data fluency, just being able to communicate and discuss data and insights and how to make business decisions with it. Finally, if you then combine it with those 33% of employees that feel data literate, 93% of them felt that they were performing well in their roles. So if we look at a correlation, if you have the skill sets with data and all the data that is coming in right now, you feel like you're performing better in your role. And we know that job satisfaction leads to better performance and things like that. So there's a massive skills gap, but there's a few things that look at this. So I want to go to the next slide. And uh, hey, Jordan, and then, before you go on, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious how you thought, how you uh, got people to express whether they feel uh, data literate. Was that did you sort of deduce that based on a bunch of questions, or is that was that kind of a straight up? Do you feel? Yeah, how do, how just do you like uh, we we conducted conducted a big survey and just straight up asked questions. How are you feeling? Um, what do you feel about this, et cetera? And understandably, when you do surveys, there could be bias and things built in. Um, yeah. But to me, the overarching message to, to your point there is that there's a large majority of the population that does not feel data literate. And we've now conducted this here in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, in the Europe region, with over 5,000 respondents in the Europe region. And they felt even less data literate than we do here in the U.S. And we're also conducting this in the, in the Asia-Pacific regions also. So trying to just grasp worldwide where people feel, based off of, to your point, survey questions on how they feel when it comes to data. Kind of bringing awareness want, and bringing the forefront. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I do, Zach, when I present things, 
Um, I'll show some charts. And, and ask people for their insights after, oh, do you feel data literate? Oh, awesome. Tell me what this chart says. <laughs> more often than not, I'm thinking these numbers were probably actually um, pretty indicative of uh, yeah. where, where people are at. Because I think people, yeah, I'm going to bring it up later, I think people are so used to just tell me the answer 16 or 17 um, or give me green, yellow, red. Yeah. And uh, actually being able to form their own opinion, I think it, 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 I think this is a very indicative of, of the where, where we're at right now. I believe yep. it. Okay, so I want to show, so a nickname I was given recently as someone came to me and said, Jordan, I need you to do something. And then they quoted Star Wars and said, help me, Obi-Wan Maroney, you're my only hope. So we, we've kind of, we've got, we've got Dalton as the click dork, we could call me Obi-Wan Maroney. Um, but what I want to show with this, imagine that you're Obi-Wan trying to teach everybody data literacy. One of the things that occurred is I want to talk about how we got to where we are, right? We just talked about how much data is being produced. We just talked about people don't go to university or school, or the majority of people, to get degrees in this. I mean, we've seen the push for STEM education now for a few years, and we, have to, we need to keep pushing that. But there's a few other things that led to it. The first one is digital transformation, right? Organizations are jumping on the the bandwagon for the Internet of Things, trying to make everything digital in their organization. Well, if people don't have data fluency or they're not data literate and you start throwing all this data at them, you're going to have a big gap. You're going to have a big issue with your workforce not being able to keep up. This is why it's very interesting to monitor companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, who started off in the digital age and compare them to companies that aren't in the digital age and watching the progress through this fourth industrial revolution with data and analytics and things that we're going through. Another thing that hit is the democratization of data, right? This is, this is one of those buzzwords. I actually was a part of this at a previous company where I was told just democratize everything out. When I suggested that we teach people how to analyze better, I actually was told no by the executives saying, nope, just throw reports out and get people to utilize them. Still frustrates me to today, uh, to no end, that they didn't like that idea, but it is what it is. Companies are throwing data at people like ever before. This goes back to Zach's point on tools. It's not about tools. You can give people amazing tools. You can give them things to use with data, but if they don't understand how to be data fluent or data alert or understand how to use it, it goes by the wayside. It's going to be a waste of an investment. We look at augmented intelligence, right? A lot of things happening now about artificial intelligence. Here at Click, we like to call it augmented intelligence for a reason. There's a lot of fear in the world that AI is going to take over everything. Well, it might automate some jobs and things like that, but the reality is we need a human touch to exist with it. And when you have a human touch, you have to have fluency. You have to have literacy with these things. And finally, we're living in an analytics economy. I don't think anybody can deny that at this point, right? is data and analytics are purveying all over the place. And the companies like Amazon, Google, those that know how to utilize it or have bigger data science centers, um, I'm not a big fan of saying everyone needs to be a data scientist in any way, but we need to have the fluency and the, the communication and the terminology flowing through an organization. People can embrace this analytics economy that exists out there. Now, one use case, this I find very interesting, that people don't realize how technical our lives can be. So I want you just to imagine real quick, imagine you're going to New York City. I'm actually going there next week, okay? Imagine you're walking in New York City and you walk by one of your favorite restaurants. I'm not getting any royalties from Palm Frites on this, but it's probably my favorite place to eat in New York City. The way that technology and our GPS and everything is going right now, I know of a use case where a company wants to be able to, as you walk past a restaurant, it will sync your purchasing habits and your GPS on your phone to shoot you a coupon directly into that restaurant that says, if you eat here now, save 15%, right? So that is just a small sample use case. Healthcare has use cases everywhere. There are use cases everywhere on data being utilized that will affect our lives. But it all goes back to, if we don't have data fluency and we don't have the skills to do it, how is this all gonna work? So I've got uh, my, my slide, and this kind of will coincide with what Zach had almost spot on, so I won't go through this is too quick, but how do you build data literacy? Or I won't go through this too long. I'll make it quick. First, I, I always tell people you've got to be curious. You need to build a curiosity in your culture and in your workforce. But one of the keys, and this was just mentioned by Zach, is the fact that we need cultures that exist within organizations where data is embraced, 
right, where it's not shunned, where it's not like it historically used to be, right? It might be with a few people in the IT world or in the risk world kind of shunned in the background, but you need the culture to embrace it all. And how do you do that? One of the keys is leadership, right? One of the things that we see popping up all over right now is leadership positions like a chief data officer, a chief analytics officer, et cetera, across organizations. If leadership can buy in to what we're trying to do, it can roll out. And finally, the learning side of things, right? You have to put learning into place. Like the book that Data Fluency, that Zach and his brother wrote, right? This is what my program does. I have a program, like I said earlier, that offers free training on culture, on topics within data literacy or data itself, like understanding what data is, understanding distributions, et cetera. These things help organizations to grow and to become more data literate. Now, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Dalton here. Um, that's my end, but I want to share one quick funny story. Before I realized it was that coming on the call, <laughs> I actually just recommended his book um, through my blog that will be coming out here very quickly on data storytelling and data fluency itself coming through there. So it was, it's, it was just nice to have this work up together that uh, we have Zach and I coming on the call, and I, did, I just didn't realize it was he and I going to be presenting today. And Hopefully, we'll get him, get him some books sold here because the reality is his book is amazing as it comes to all of this stuff and embracing the data fluency and the data literacy uh, culture that needs to exist. So, Dalton, I'll turn it back to you. Hopefully, that was okay, and uh, we'll keep rolling here. Thank you. That was fantastic. If it wasn't okay, I'll just edit it out before I post this anyway. Yeah, that works perfect. <laughs> No, I'm teasing. That's the whole beauty of a doorcast. I'm I'm just looking for open and honest. Um, what I love that what I wanted to do in bringing you guys together um, was, was give people two different perspectives. You use different terms, but I think we're we're absolutely talking the same thing, and I think a lot of it is need. So, um, what, uh, something that I wanted to bring up. Um, that Zach mentioned in different terms. I think of them as developers versus end users. Um, Zach, on your slides, you had author and audience and data providers and data consumers. Um, it almost seems to me like there's kind of a battle, um, and I use this image for you, Obi-Wan, um, <laughs> like a battle between, hey, I'm more interested in a tool that makes my life easy as a developer. Right, I, I want a pretty pie chart. I, I want to be able to show my boss how amazing my visualization skills are. Now, whether anybody can use it or not, who cares? Because clearly the whole world revolves around me. Um, so well, how do you guys see this, and, and do you see anything changing in this battle? Is the force moving towards the end user or data consumer side in any way in terms of what you guys are seeing? I think it is an interesting dichotomy there. Although, like, there's such interdependence, which might be a whole force thing too. <laughs> I think that's the theme of the latest Star Wars. Um, there's, and we were actually speaking to a really large insurance company um, where they had they had a big town hall meeting, and someone had raised this question of to the CEO, "What are we doing about data fluency?" Um, and the CEO didn't really have an answer to that. And, and that's why and they actually ended up coming and talk to us about this and being like, how do we build a more data fluent organization? And then the, and they were asking this question, like, where do we start with the developers or the end users, the authors or the recipient or the consumers? I guess I don't I don't think you can really separate them out. I mean, I, th I think it's you know, it's communication. We're talking about communication and more effective communication, and it takes two people to communicate. You know, it, it takes the end users coming, building the skills so that they can actually not be afraid when they are confronted with data and they and they will engage with it. Like that's the step that I think these non-analysts need to take is to be open to exploring <coughs> data in new ways and um, and not fearful of it and and, the, and maybe that the step on the developer side is even larger to say, you do need to put those end users first and, and your analytical tool is not value, valuable in the least unless 
and users are engaging with it and making decisions on it and make that kind of the criteria of whether they're being successful or not, not whether they like pumped out more reports or 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 more complex dashboards. So I guess those those sides to me are just it's there's no way I don't know I didn't know how when they were asking us where do we start I was like I don't I don't think you can pick one I think that they, they yeah. connect together so much. Great. And I'll, yeah. I'll piggyback right off on this Dalton that I think what we're seeing is I, I I don't think you can pick one or the other I think what we're seeing is historically developers have had a lot of focus right it's been on how to develop in this and the end user maybe was an afterthought but what I think we're starting to see in kind of the in the culture across the world or in economies across the world is that instead of being one or the other, it's just that end users have now kind of come to the forefront maybe a little bit more in that they're going to be using data more often. Historically, that wasn't necessarily the case. And so I don't think it's a one or the other, but this like kind of feel really goes back to one, the fluency in communication skills and two, the culture of it, where organizations, when you establish the proper culture around things, then the developers and engineers work hand in hand together, not seen as a separate thing, but are a joint force to make things more powerful. And that goes to the communication. Can they talk back and forth about what is needed, what we're working on, business decisions, et cetera. But it really is more that end users weren't, I think they were seen as an afterthought historically, but now they can't be seen as an afterthought anymore. And it's how do you build everything together to kind of make a seamless or more powerful organization and culture around data itself. Awesome. Yeah, that's it. Just um, yeah, I, I, I the, the, the whole this whole topic. I think we could definitely do a whole other one. <laughs> Maybe we need to do like a series of like a week long doorcast or something. <laughs> um, I, the the odds that anybody watches a, a week long YouTube is is pretty fun to none. So I want to get to the next one. Um, so I want to bring up your book again, um, Zach. One of the things that I I, I saw interesting here and. Um, if I'm completely wrong, remember, I, I, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, and that, that's where I get my knowledge. Um, it looks like a sand key diagram uh, on the front right. of your book. You got which that. I thought, yeah, which was very, very exciting to me. Um, and a sand key, this was – your book's been out for years. You kind of understood the sand key. I think you probably used it as an image um, on purpose. It is pretty – um, but to me, a sand key represents a great visualization that shows the relationships between dimensions and, and, and information in your data. Um, so I love the sim symbolism of it to begin with. Um, and I think it's kind of ironic that the industry, in terms of all the visualizations tools, still really haven't caught up with the sand key to begin with. But that's a whole other subject. Um, so you've had this book out for a number of years. It is you use the phrase we wrote the book on it, um, and sadly there aren't a whole lot. As I go look things up today, despite how big data literacy um, is becoming as a demand and a need, there still aren't more resources on it. Jordan, you've been writing a series of articles for a long time. Um, things are starting to get picked up by others. Um, and, and the work you're doing with your data literacy courses are, are, are being um, seen and consumed by a number of large organizations as kind of definitive work on it and, and the subject's coming out. Why do you guys think there aren't more resources on this? Because it, there's such a big need, and normally when there's a need, people step in and fill that need. Why is there still a gap in education on this subject? Well, I, I'll, I'll talk first, that's okay, Zach, on this. I, I, Please. I was a part of a, a webinar once that I think touched upon this really well. And my, my thought process around this is, for years, the reason that we're not seeing too much fill this arena yet, I'm, I'm going to preface that with yet because I think it's coming, but um, for years we were so focused on the tools themselves for business intelligence and data and analytics, right? We were so focused on all these products that were being released all these cool features that were being built, all these capabilities, so many different tools, democratizing it, et cetera, that we literally just forgot the fact that we're also not tra – we're training people how to use a tool. We're just not training them how to be smart with data. And I think we neglected it. And so I think just over the past couple of years, people finally had an aha moment, an oops moment, that for years 
we, we neglected one key thing to make these tools and everything be utilized effectively, and that is the fluency and literacy of the workforce. And so just in the past year or two, start, you're actually seeing analyst firms starting to talk about this a lot. Articles are popping up all over the place. I think there will be coming a wave of organizations that are trying to fill this gap. Um, thankfully, you know, here at Click, we've been doing it for a couple of years now and seen a lot of success with it. The reality is I think it's coming. I think more and more is going to be happening with it. Um, but I just think it was just a, a, an oversight on our part where we were so focused on all these cool things with tools that we just neglected it. But now we're at a point where I, I think that neglect is going to go away, and we're about to start to see organizations um, trying to attack this head on more and more. Yeah, I, I hope so. And I, I don't have a good answer to it either. It, it, I, in some ways, I, I can't also, I also can't believe it's taking so long for people to understand kind of the miss the miss here, because when you get on the ground in organizations talking about how they use data and the reports they have, and you just see so much dysfunction. I'm sure you guys see this all the time. There's just, you know, people are struggling, they're unhappy, they get, they receive a lot of data, but they don't use any of the data that they receive. Um, you know, the the view from the ground is, is a mess, I think. Um, and yet, it hasn't really been solved. I think, you know, it, it may be kind of just the evolution of, of technology. So I'll just to kind of go along with what Jordan was talking about this. I think, you know, any technology sort of starts out the, the arena in the kind of um, purview of the experts in that area. So for a long time, like you could be a computer expert and you were very, you were sort of that special person. And, you know, um, and I think in the data area, like it was, it was kind of the analysts and the technologists who had access to the data viewed the data as kind of their world and the area and they had this specialized knowledge and, and the, you know, anytime data gets delivered to a broader audience in our experience, um, the world does not immediately get easier for that person who is delivering the data. So, um, in fact, it gets harder because you deliver this data to a broader audience and then the question, the tidal wave of questions come back. What, is this, what does this mean? Why are you, and you're challenging sometimes people's understanding of the world. The data is kind of conflicting with what they thought was happening. They don't understand what data means. They, they, they question um, what they're seeing. And that, you know, that doesn't make it easy for the analyst or the technologist who's putting together the reports to, to kind of want to get it in everyone's hands and then have to deal with the, the blowback of that. So I think there's been kind of a, a probably too long period of, of it being an area where just the specialists would, were able to touch the data. Um, but, you know, hopefully that is kind of cracking open now. Yep. Yeah, that's, it's, um, it, it goes back to the first question I asked. Um, the developers versus end users um, and, and where the focus is. Um, one of the things that I like, I'll probably end up doing a completely another doorcast series on storytelling with data. Um, but what I love from people like um, Cole and Leah Pika is I, I, you got to use your data to, to convey something of value to the end users. Um, and the focus, hopefully, for developers and visualization experts, it's not about you blowing the minds of other visualization experts. It's about you conveying something of use to the people that can make money on what you're conveying. Um, and what I see in the industry, some great visualizations, which I'm all about, and perhaps the great visualizations help make it easier for people to consume the data um, when you mentioned um, in, in your conversation, Zach, uh, about the chaos created um, mm -hmm. by the influx of data, um, it almost made me laugh. Um, when I, I wrote my first um, article, a blog on the subject of data literacy a couple years ago, and I called it a data tornado. Um, and Jordan, it was funny because then you ended up kind of touching on that same subject showing this ridiculous chart of how many bytes of data and how many different types of unstructured data were coming out there 
um, I, I think we're all on the same page. There's so much coming. Um, if, if I was an end user, I would be um, both scared of what's happening and how am I possibly going to do my job and provide insights for the organizations I'm working at, um, and also challenge to go learn. And so I, I kind of had used this to drive people towards um, your book, Zach, years ago. Um, but I but I think it's an important thing. If, if you're a data scientist reading this, you're aware of this, right? I mean, that's your daily life is dealing with data because other people, I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. Please tell me. I'll pay you big dollars to tell me what to do. Um, if you're an, an average John and Jane Doe, you need to brush up on your skills. I mean, this is one of those things that you know you had to take reading, writing, arithmetic, and you need to become data literate um, in, in order to be able to provide the value to your organization that they need out there. Um, guys, I'm going to give you um, the ability to, to uh, share anything before we go here. Give, give us your last words of wisdom. Go ahead, Zach. All right, I'm going to I'm going to share a little bit, just to share my information. But it, I mean, maybe I was I was thinking of another question, which uh, wouldn't isn't necessarily words of wisdom, but um, just throw throw one more question out there, and 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 we might have probably not have time to kind of delve into it. But I sort of one of the things I wonder is whether um, all the interest in in data science and AI and the kind of capabilities of of allowing machines to interpret and predict the meaning of data is is yet another effort to try to skip this really important step that we that we're laying out here to say like at some point real human beings need to communicate with other real human beings using data as a way that they talk back and forth and have an understanding of their world that's like People need to get good at that in order to assimilate this data and make it useful in their lives. And and the question I kind of had occurs to me is like it it feels a little bit like all the energy putting into data science is another way of trying to skip that process and saying, well, don't worry about it. You don't have to learn how to to communicate with data, be data literate, because the machines are going to do that for you. It's just going to tell you the answer because we're going to build a big powerful model that that leaps straight to the endpoint and doesn't and continues to exclude the human element and i think that's the thing that jordan and i are really push it on here is to say like data is great insofar it is, is combined with people thinking human beings who are interpreting it and understanding what it means and and bringing in their their context and it may be that um, as much as we want people to engage with this that that we're a little bit at odds with the the data science um, energy that that doesn't care as much about that as as we seem to. That's a downer note, Dalton. Sorry about that. No, that is actually fantastic, dude. This is awesome on how we're going to play this. So, Jordan, you ended up choosing to be last, so now I'm going to put the pressure on you. <laughs> you brought up the term augmented intelligence. Right, and that's a term that we've been talking about for a long time, and a term that I think the industry is having a hard time understanding um, and appreciating. And I think that term goes right along with what Zach just shared. Right? It's oh, I don't maybe, completely agree. You know, do we are, are people having a hard time really understanding that message of augmented intelligence and and letting the human so how about you share like an example or two of when you talk about augmented intelligence, what you mean there, and why there is a value of not skipping the human but supplementing what the robots or the machines can do. Uh, uh, so you, I'm going to let you end perfect. with that. Oh, man, you, you just said it perfect. I'm going to piggyback on, off your term that you just used on supplementing. Yeah, I, I think one reason, I'm going to take a step back, I think, and I'll try and be quick here as I know we're on, we're on time, but one of the things that I think is happening is part of the reason I think we were seeing so much on AI and things like that and why there's fear and are we just surpassing that is because 
that's what's getting published in the media, right? That's what people are seeing and reading. They're reading about jobs are going to be lost. They're reading about all these different things. So in their minds, they're already formulating their own biases around what AI is going to be and what robots are going to do, et cetera. But they need to take a step back. And this is, this is the hard part. I wish I had, you know, the crystal ball to tell us how to help people do that, to step back off that ledge. Augmented intelligence is going to be a valuable skill, right? The human touch is absolutely going to be a valuable skill. For example, you could have an algorithm, to your point, uh, an example, Dalton, you could have an algorithm spit out all this information for you. But what is that going to do for you if you do not have an, a human on the other side that knows what to do with those business decisions? So it becomes a kind of a combination, a supplement, where the human element comes in to make the business decision. It's totally fine to have an algorithm, a robot, AI, whatever, spit out all this information. But you need a human element in there to apply context, to apply all these different things. One example that one of my coworkers likes to use is what about uh, an algorithm spitting out spurious correlations or correlations that don't even matter? If all you do is rely on that robot, then the spurious correlation could drive a business decision when that means nothing, right? It actually doesn't do anything for you. The human element has to come in. This is why uh, skills and data fluency, looking at the visualization that a robot might present to you, being able to then interpret it, apply that human element to it will allow you to, one, differentiate yourself in this coming revolution that we have with some more robotics and automation in there, but two, the human is what needs to be a part of it to help drive business decisions or should be a part of it. You can't just rely on robots to do everything. The humans have to be in there. And this is that augmented intelligence that you're talking about. And I think that will be the key. That is why data fluency, visualizations, data literacy, all these things matter because it's that positions you to be able to interpret and do things. Hopefully that's a good answer for you. That's a phenomenal answer for me, especially for a guy who just stayed at the Holiday Inn Express. 